Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. All right. Well, um, Sean asked me to come back and teach Genesis 26 and 27. That's all the further we got here through the study. So why don't we open up with prayer and we'll get going on it. Lord, thank you for this opportunity and thank you most of all for your word. It is such a blessing to be able to study it. It's a blessing to let it work in our lives, to speak to us. Uh, because as you've promised, it is a word that does not come back void that we will be blessed as we look at it here tonight. And we just thank you in advance for what you will show us and reveal to us in, in our own lives and how you are magnified and glorified through it. And so we just pray that that's uh, what would happen when we leave here, that uh, we would be able to see your glory more clearly and uh, that you would be blessed by um, uh, seeing us grow towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, um, in Genesis 26, we've got two very different stories here going on between chapter 26 and 27. So uh, we're going to deal with 26 first, and then we're going to kind of take a switch gears in chapter 27 as the scriptures do. But um, the first one here is about Isaac and Abimelech. And it starts out here, it says this, Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech. And Abimelech is the king of the Philistines in Gerar. Abimelech is probably most likely the name of a king, not like the personal name, but like Pharaoh, uh, just the general name of the king of the Philistines at that time, because we see Abimelech uh, prior to this as well, and it's not the same person. But um, the other thing is, is that Today we see famines and whatnot, and sometimes we can get all excited and um, prophetic about things that are going on, which I think there's, don't get me wrong, there's room for that. But we also have to realize there's nothing new under the sun. Okay? From ancient times, there have been these trials, these tragedies, these things that God allows to happen, and sometimes it's for good reason. We see that when the famine takes place in Egypt, um, <coughs> one of the primary reasons that God even allows that to happen is to move Israel uh, to Egypt to get them where he wants them to be. And so um, while I, I think that there's no question God does use those things today and whatnot, um, and the Bible says there will be an increase in earthquakes and those type of things, we also have to understand that uh, this is the world. And while the world wants to scream out, global warming, we're all going to die, um, we have to realize God is in control of this. And there's nothing you can do to, to control global warming. I frankly think global warming is a hoax. Um, it is not scientific and it's certainly not biblical. Um, but anyway, bottom line, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Verse 2, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Basically saying, stay here. Okay, But as we're going to see, he's going to go as far as he can without disobeying God. He's going to push that limit a little bit. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. It's very important. This, he's saying, you stay here, I'm going to be with you, but I'm going to confirm the oath. If you were here Sunday, one of the things I talked about is the value and the importance of the promise. And that's what we see here. He is highlighting the main reasons. I'm going to confirm my promise with you. This is something that you're going to carry with you. And it's a very uh, vital part of this story. Verse 4, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give them all these lands. And though your offspring, or through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. Notice again, like we talked about on Sunday. Why? Because Abraham did what? He obeyed. And as Christians, we cannot live in this cheap grace kind of thing that, uh, you know, hey, Christianity is free. Yes, it is. Grace is free. But as I said Sunday, it costs everything. 
Okay? There is an, a, a response to the gospel that God requires. Abraham was justified by faith, but yet it says because he obeyed. Because he obeyed, it was evidence that he had faith, you might say. Okay? So it wasn't his obedience that saved him, but his obedience came because of his faith. That's why Jesus says a tree is judged by its fruit. Okay? By this you will recognize them. And today our churches are filled with people living under the grace that has been preached in churches without a response of obedience. And uh, these are those uh, people who turn the, the freedom or grace of God into a license to sin, as Jude talks about. Verse 6, so Isaac stayed in Gerar. And what's important about that is where Gerar is. It is right on the border right on the border of Egypt, basically saying it's this, I am going to stay as close to where I'm not supposed to go as possible. And uh, I don't know who said it, but you've probably heard it before too, that uh, when you draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to cross this, it seems like that's what we do in, in our lives is we say, okay, I won't cross this line, but we'll go right up to the edge. But what God wants is for us to draw a line and stay far away from that line as possible. Okay? And uh, that should be our goal, to kind of rethink our thinking that way. And rather than saying, well, uh, rated R is my line, and you can go any PG-13, but what if that PG-13 movie has things where God's name is being taken in vain? You know, what about those kinds of things? Uh, one of my favorite B-grade movies, um, I'm trying to think of the title of it here now, but maybe it'll come to me. But anyway, there's a line in it. It's a Christian film, and I love it because basically the time machine is the name. They create a time machine, and they bring people back to the future to 2000. And this guy's from the 1800s. And he's arguing that you cannot teach morality without Christ. Okay, which is what we're trying to do today, you know, it, by handing out condoms and doing things like, you can't teach morality without Christ. Christ is the reason that we obey. He's the reason we have morality. You can't be good without him. Well, apart from faith, it's sin. Bottom line. Romans tells us that. And so anyway, the point being is they bring these guys, you know, to the year 2005 or whatever it is, and they go to a movie. The church group goes to a movie. Well, this guy who is from the past 100 years comes running out of the movie theater saying, stop, stop the film. And he's talking to the guy behind the counter. He says, stop the film. They're, they're taking the name of the Lord in vain. And they're all looking at him like, what's wrong with you? Then when the movie's out, you know, all the Christians are coming out and they're like just talking and, oh, wasn't that a great movie? You know? And it's like, well, they took the name of the Lord in vain. Yeah, but it was just a little bit. See, this is the problem, is you don't draw a line and see how close you can get to it. We should be offended by that. This is our God. And, and when people take his name in vain, we don't even think about it today. Because we've come as close to that line as possible. We don't want to do that. So this is what Isaac uh, does here. Now... It picks up in verse 7, when the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she's my sister, because he was afraid to say, she's my wife. He thought, the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebecca, because she's beautiful. Now, where do you think he came up with that idea? His dad, like father, like son, right? You see, I bet he knew what his father did. His father Abraham did the exact same thing with Sarah. Tell him that you're my sister. Now, I'm sure he heard that story, and I'll bet he even heard the story of how God stepped in to, you know, solve this problem. But he's scared. He's fearful. Just like sometimes we get scared and we don't know. We know what we're supposed to do, but we want to take things into our own hands to solve our problems rather than just being patient and let God solve that problem. Whether it be a marriage that just isn't good, and we think, ah, I'm going to take things into my own hands. I'm going to leave her or him. I'm going to get a divorce because this will never work out. Rather than being patient and let God change hearts and minds. I mean, I could give you thousands of examples of where we step in 
to take control rather than letting God do his thing. And that is what Isaac is doing here. He's scared. He feels like he has no other option. They're going to kill her or me to get to her. And therefore, let's lie. Let's go against the commands of God. So we see here then, um, she is my sister, Isaac answered, because I thought that I might lose my life on account of her. Verse 10, then Abimelech said, what is this that you have done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Why didn't he just say, you lied to me. I'm going to kill you. I mean, you would think he'd have every right. Do you think maybe like father, like son, he also remembered a story of his father? And when his father had the same situation happen to him, God closed the womb of all the women in the household. His father knew, you don't mess with the God of Abraham. And that's the same God of Isaac. And I'm scared to touch this man because he has a story too from his father. And so maybe that is why we don't know for sure, but I think that there's a good possibility he knew how dangerous it was uh, to mess with God's people. Isaac planted crops here in verse 12 in that land in the same year reaped a hundredfold. What I love about that is this is when we start hearing about the blessings. It says, because the Lord blessed him. He's not blessed until the sin is exposed. He confesses his sin. It's all out, and now the blessings come. I'll tell you, any Christian who has lived a life of struggles and trials and constant failures can tell you and testify to this truth. Until we clean house... Until we confess our sins, you will not experience the blessings of God. Now, I am not preaching a prosperity gospel here that, hey, as soon as you start turning your life over to God, all your problems go away. Jesus said that isn't true, right? He said, I tell you the truth. He says, you will be persecuted on account of me. But it is completely different. Okay, I've seen so many people walking through this world and they're not walking in obedience. And what do we see? We see just one roadblock after another where God is trying to bring them back, calling them. And he wants to bless them, but he cannot bless them as, as they continue to walk in disobedience, as they continue to make poor decision after poor decision because they're trying to solve the problems themselves rather than letting God tell them where they need to go and be. And so... Uh, the blessings do not come until Isaac realizes, I've done wrong. He confesses his sin, and now we see God stepping in to open up the blessings. Okay. Verse 13, the man became rich, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. The ungodly, these people who may have looked at him and said, why is God blessing this guy? He lied. He ate. Okay, but I think they see that there was a change in his life too, probably. And even the ungodly are now envying them. Okay, it says, So all the wells that his father's servant had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. They were so jealous, they didn't like him, they wanted him to go. They, they were just being, well, they were persecuting him. Kind of like what I said, Jesus said, on account of me, you're going to be persecuted. It was on account of, they see all these blessings, they see God is with him, and so they're attacked and he is persecuted because of God and the blessings that he gives. And I'll tell you something, that's another thing that you're going to see, is that as a Christian who begins to walk and follow in God's word, you will be persecuted. And you know what? Not just by the enemies, not just by the Philistines, but by your own people. The people of the church will be envious of the blessings that God gives you sometimes. And you'll be saying, oh, well, who do you think you are? Do you think you're holier than thou? you think you're better than me? And if they don't say it, they may just be thinking it. 
that because you walk with God, you think you're so holy. No, I don't think I'm so holy, but I am going to do my best to walk with God. But do you know what that is? That's usually the Spirit of God pricking a conscience. You know, when I would do street evangelism, when we would go out, we could speak truth and you would see that the consciences of people would be pricked simply by the word that was being said. And they don't like how it makes them feel. There's a verse in Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 43 or 44. And I love it. It says this, it says, show the people of Israel the temple of God so that they may be ashamed of their sins. You know, we always think about the temple of God and it's like, what was a temple for? One of the reasons was to show them their sins. And it says, if they are ashamed of all that they have done, show them the, de the whole design of its temple, its entrances, its exits, its entrances. You see, we are now the temple of God, aren't we? That's what scriptures say, we are the temple. And I'll tell you something, when you are purified in Christ, your very existence is going to make other people ashamed even people in the church. Show them the temple of God so that they may be ashamed of their sins. I'll tell you, I've got a brother who's a practicing homosexual. He can't stand to be around me and all I do is love on him. I don't want to tolerate homosexuality, but I love him. And he hates me. He despises me. Why? Because the temple of God is revealing his sins to him. I think that's one of the reasons these Philistines, the enemies, envy Isaac. They can't stand it because it reveals to them their weaknesses, their faults, but they just aren't humble and willing enough to surrender and give their life to Christ, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and soon to be Jacob. Well, verse 16, the, then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and he encamped in the valley of Gerar where he settled. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. So obviously, uh, he was familiar of his father's history here. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, The water is ours. So he named the well Essek, which means contention, because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna, meaning hatred. And I don't believe this is Isaac's hatred towards them, but their hatred towards Isaac. He moved on from there and he dug another well and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. What I love about this is, this is kind of how I lead my ministry, how I try to lead my life. Not always successful, but I'll tell you, I can look back on my life and compare it to where I'm at now. And wow, what a difference. God will many times bring roadblocks into your life. People filling up your wells, putting walls in front, keeping you from moving forward. And we're like, oh, what's going on? But yet it's God trying to move you somewhere else. Just like I said about those famines, that was to get, you know, God to get Israel where they were supposed to be. God does that in my life. And in the ministry that I have, I, I try to always let God open the doors and close the doors. Our uh, mobile creation museum, the Semisaurus, I didn't start that until he brought it to me, literally. For years I prayed for the museum, nothing happened. And one day out of the blue, somebody calls and says, hey, have you ever thought about doing a museum? Well, as a matter of fact, I have for a lot of years, <laughs> okay? But I pray and I pray and I be patient and I wait. And sometimes maybe it won't ever happen because it's not the best thing. But the bottom line is you don't go through the door until God opens it. I think that Isaac knew that. Rather than get all upset and try and fight it, hey, I'm going to fight this in court. I'm going to do whatever. He says, well, I guess God is saying no. We'll just call this contention and I'm going to move on. Well, I guess God is still saying no. We'll call this one hatred. They still hate me. I'm going to move on until finally we see God says, yes, stay here. Now, again, we could give thousands of examples, and I could from my own life, 
to show you how God has answered prayers and opened doors. But I think this is a good way to live our lives. Wait for God to open the doors. Now, I know that that can go into a lot of things. How do you know the doors open, all of these kinds of things? Well, bottom line, I think one of the answers is the peace of God. He's going to give you a peace. Okay? Uh, I used the example on Sunday about building a home. You know, people can build a home, but, you know, the Bible does say unless the Lord builds a house, it's laborers or it's builders labor in vain. Right? And... I'm not saying that you have to wait for, you know, everything to be perfect. But there will be a peace that God is going to give you as you're moving forward. And I'm sure there will be trials and tribulations. I mean, I don't know if you can build a house without having some kind of issues like that. But the bottom line is there will be a blessing. You're going to see the peace of God as it goes through. And so I can't give you a nice little formula to tell you how God is opening or closing doors. He'll show you that as long as you are open, you are willing to be patient, and you are willing to listen and give him your all first. He will guide. He'll have somebody call you up. I would love, to, I, I don't know if I, I probably don't have time, but I'm going to do it anyway. How I got into ministry, it's amazing. I've been praying for years. I wanted to go into full-time creation ministry. I was a principal of a Christian school. My wife didn't even want me to talk about it. Never even wanted me to bring it up. Because how are we ever going to survive? How are we going to make money? It scared her. I don't blame her. And I thought, well, Lord, I am not going to drag her into this. So I said, Lord, you have got to bring her on board. This was years of praying. I had even kind of almost forgotten about it a little bit. And one day I come home after school and she comes in and she says, we need to talk. And I thought, oh, what did I do? <laughs> and she said, I, I think you need to go full time creation ministry. I'm like, oh, this was not a small prayer that was answered, but it was an open door. Now I'm the one going, that's cool, God, but how? <laughs> now I'm the one that's scared. How are you going to provide? How are you going to take care of me? And I began to lift up the finances. Lord, you got to show me because I don't know how I can survive with this. One week later, somebody knocks on our door. I think they want to talk about their kids and they give me an $8,000 check for our ministry. The biggest check by about $7,500 I had ever gotten for ministry prior to that. And only one $500 check before that. And I'm thinking, okay, God, this is another open door. You're confirming your first prayer. The first board meeting of the year, I said, all right, this is it. Uh, I'm, this is going to be my last year here. I need to let you know because I got to do some planning here. And bottom line, we needed a house to live in now because the house we were living in came along with the job. So I had no place to live and I got no money. And I'm thinking if I can survive off of $12,000 a year, okay, $1,000 a month, I think I can do it. So we start looking at homes that we literally can see light through. Okay. Not finding anything, just the doors aren't open. We make a fair offer. The offer doesn't come through. And um, pretty soon I get a call at school, and it's uh, a guy who says that he's got five acres of land he'd like to donate to us. Okay. Well, actually, let me back up. Before that happens, we hear that the hospital is getting rid of homes in town. We go and look at these, uh, there, there are a few houses. We walked into the second one. My wife loved it, just like that. They were selling about twelve dollars to $15,000 a piece. To this day, I don't know why, but I asked the guy, I said, so would you take $300? He said, sure. What? So we bought our home for $300. Another open door. Now, though, we need land because it needs to be moved off. Now, we're looking for land. We make an offer on one. It doesn't go through a very fair offer. I was doing a radio interview about the ministry on KROA. I'm driving back to the school, and I'm praying, God, I feel like I jumped ahead of you on this other offer we made on the land. If I did, don't let it work. I trust you. I was just at complete peace. I get to the um, office. The phone rings, and it's that guy saying, We'd like, or at first it's the realtor saying they didn't accept the offer. 
I think we offered like $500 less. Very fair offer. And I said, then we don't want it. Because I just prayed, don't let this happen then. I went and told my wife. And she's like, oh, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know, but I'm at peace. God will take care of this. It wasn't 15 minutes and the phone rang again. And it was that guy saying, we would like to donate five acres of land to you. <laughs> now I've got a home. Now I've got land. And it comes to move the, land, move the house. Guess how much it cost? $8,000. <laughs> I went and I asked the guy who donated the money to the ministry. I said, here's the deal. We're trying to get started in ministry. We don't know how this is going to work. I don't know where the money is coming from. Would you mind if I use that so that we can get started so we don't have a house payment and all those things? He said, absolutely. So, I don't know if that helps to understand but this is what I mean by open doors. You pray, and God will either say yes or no. And if he says no, be happy. But those are plugged up wells. Okay? Or in some cases, he lets the, op the well be open. And then you move. You just, and then you don't move until he tells you to move again. And I've always said there may be a day he's going to say, this ministry is over because I want you somewhere else. And I'm not going to go kicking and screaming. I'll be thankful for the time that he's given me. So anyway, um, God sometimes brings trouble and some, uh, you know, to, to move us. Verse 23, from there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid for I am with you. I will bless you and I will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. One of the things I like here is, why was he going to bless him? Because, and for the sake of my servant Abraham. It wasn't because of Jacob, or Isaac, I mean, right? It's for the sake of Abraham I'm going to bless you. Isn't that something? It's just like when the Israelites went into the promised land. God says this. He says, do not think it's on account of your righteousness or your integrity that I'm bringing you in to, take, or to give you their land. But it's on account of their wickedness. Israel didn't get to go into the promised land because they were so good and they earned it. Just like, you know what? You aren't going to get to heaven because you've ever earned it or are good enough. It's not because of your righteousness or your integrity. It's because of God's promise to Abraham. The very blessing Isaac gets, you get. Why? For the sake of Abraham. God made a promise to him and God never comes back on a promise. If you were here Sunday and you heard me preaching, that's what I mean. This oath, this promise, it all goes back to that. In Romans, it says that we have all been grafted into a tree. What is that tree? It is that covenant. Okay? And it says, you know, today the church, we boast over Israel. We boast over the Jew. Well, the Jews have rejected God. No, they haven't. Many Jews have accepted him. As a matter of fact, the early church was a Jewish church. We today boast over those branches. And God warns us in Romans, if you do, be afraid. Because God, okay, he says he can cut you off as well. Because you, you're going to say, well, natural, the natural branches were broken off. Yes, they were because of unbelief. But you stand by faith, provided you continue to stand in faith. So don't boast over that. Realize it's the same promise of Abraham why you are getting to heaven. Because of God's faithfulness, not your integrity, not your righteousness. But because of that promise, we believe in that promise, we have faith in that promise. And now we obey God because of that promise. It's that simple. But it all goes back to this promise for the sake of Abraham. All right, goes on to verse 26. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come in to, them, or come in to him from Gerar with Ahuzeth, his personal advisor, and Phicol, the commander of his forces. Isaac asked them, Why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. So we said, there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we did not harm you, but always treated you well and sent you away peacefully. Somebody's lying here, right? You sent me away in hostility. 
They're saying, we sent you away peacefully, right? Well, we know what the true story is, but they're scared. They're scared. There's a day coming, folks. Right now, you're being persecuted. But I'll tell you something. When all the world starts to be in chaos, I can guarantee you this. It's not going to make them believe in God. The Bible says that in Revelation, but I'll tell you something. They're going to be scared. They're going to be scared. They're going to recognize God is with you. They're going to hate you all the more, and they're going to hate God all the more, but they're still going to be scared of you because they don't understand it. I think my brother, in some ways, is scared of me. Not me, but Christ in me. I think that's what they're seeing here. It says, uh, sent you away peacefully, and now you are blessed by the Lord. Verse 30, Isaac then made a feast for them. They ate and drank. Yeah, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Verse 31, early the next morning, the men swore on oath to each other. The, then Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. That day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug. They said, we found water, and he called it Sheba. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. It means seven wells. There came a time of the Philistines um, here where they couldn't help but recognize God was with him. That's what they say. We see now God is with you. Okay? Even our enemies should be able to tell that we're different. Sadly, I don't know if many people can tell the difference in the church today, who goes to church and who doesn't, at work or wherever they are. But you see, Isaac, there was something about him, more than just he was rich. There was something about Isaac that the Philistines, the enemies of God, were recognizing that God was with him. And they could see it. Chapter closes out here in verse 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beri the Hittite, and also Basemith, daughter of Elon the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Okay? Marrying outside of the clan, going against the word of God. Uh, we see here at this point we don't have um, you know, Deuteronomy and all those laws telling us this, but we do see it seem to, they, they know, you, you were supposed to marry within your clan. And we see that even foreshadowed before the law itself is given. And uh, this will come out in other parts of the story later. But verse, uh, or chapter 27 here, verse 1. Any thoughts before we move on out of that chapter? Anybody has or questions? I have a question. Yeah. John often talks about how you can see Jesus in every chapter of the Bible. Yeah. How do you see Jesus in this? I see him in a lot of different ways. First of all, like I said, the blessings of God. Christ is that blessing for us. Um, I see that just like uh, the Philistines, it's the enemy. That's the devil. The devil is going to hate you all the more because Jesus is in you. And uh, we see that Isaac is a type of Christ figure here as well. And so Isaac is, um, we're, we're getting that promise. Like I said, he's blessed because of the promise. Christ is a child of promise, as Isaac is a child of promise. Really, it's not just this one story, but it's the whole story. When you put it together, you see Isaac as a Christ figure. You see Rebecca as a, a picture of the church as well. Um, if you kind of look back, um, we see that when Abraham gets a... a a wife, he sends a servant to go get a wife for Isaac, right? Okay, and um, that's kind of what God has done. The Spirit is that servant who has, goes out to the church to invite you to come to be a bride for him. And so there's pictures like that that we see. So especially as you look at the whole picture that we're not getting in one chapter here, it's even more clear. So, chapter 27, verse 1. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I'm now an old man. Now, what's funny here is I think that he's got a syndrome I have. It's kind of like, I think I'm about ready to die, and I'm only 48, okay? He's going to live another 43 years. 
He's 137 years old now. And he says, I'm old. <laughs> okay. But I'm about to go is what he's thinking. Okay. And so he's got a quite a long life yet ahead of him. Um, also, Esau and Jacob at this time, when you look at your Sunday school stories, when you picture this in your mind, this whole story of Jacob deceiving Esau, what do you picture them? How old do you think they'd be? Yeah, less than 20. You see them as kids almost, right? Teenagers. They're 77 years old. Yeah. Okay, so old enough to know better, um, but uh, this is kind of one of those things when you grow up seeing these flannel graph and these pictures in your Sunday school books, it really shapes our worldview, doesn't it? Of how we look at things. And we got to really be careful because the church has shaped a lot of our worldview that isn't necessarily accurate. Okay. We could go on to, you know, an apple for the tree of life to, you know, uh, or a tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, we, we just automatically go to an apple when in the scriptures don't say that. Uh, the three wise men. Okay. There may be some indications that there could be three, but it doesn't say that. There, there's so many things that we see in pictures in our mind. Or Noah's Ark is some little bathtub boat, you know, with 15 animals poking their heads out. <laughs> Having a great time. Okay. Not like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, it says, I'm old and I don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow. Go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, what we see here prior to this, we don't get it in this chapter, but a little background. We see that Jacob was a mama's boy, is often portrayed, and Esau was a daddy's boy. Esau was a man of the, the ground and a hunter and all of that. Jacob took care of the tents. Now, you kind of picture that as a mama's boy, maybe a little sissy kind of thing. It's not like that. Okay, back then, being a man of the tents was, was very still masculine and good. But the, the homosexual community picks up on these kind of things, and they think maybe Jacob was really gay and all of this garbage that the scriptures clearly do not support. But um, we often, Jacob gets this bad picture because his name is the deceiver, or literally the supplanter, um, that he's deceiving here as well, that he's going to deceive Laban. But really, none of that's necessarily the case, okay? Because, first of all, we see Jacob is a Christ figure. But we also see that Re Rebecca, his mom, is the one that's going to urge him to do this. Now, I'm not going to say he's completely innocent in all of this either, but I'm just saying he gets a kind of a bad rap. When it comes to Laban and putting stripes on the wood so that he would be able to ultimately take Laban's flocks, we see that God told him to do that in a dream. Okay? And so I think that Jacob is not necessarily the, the bad guy that is often pictured in our, again, our worldview that we've had from growing up. But I, I don't have time to get into all of that. That kind of fits better with some other stories that would come up. But just kind of keep that in mind. Um, so Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat, so that he may go give you his blessing before he dies. Now, as I said Sunday, I'd like that recipe. Okay? I have been trying to get my, my uh, wife to eat deer for 30 years. Okay? She hates deer, no matter what I do with it. And somehow, she must have a recipe that uh, Isaac does not have a clue that it's not wild game. Okay, so the point being is, it wasn't because of the food Isaac loved Esau. There was something else, some kind of connection that they had, okay, but it wasn't the food because Rebecca can make it just as well without having to go get it there, right? And so um, 
The other thing is, again, this is uh, Rebecca that is really kind of instigating all of this. Um, we're about to get into what I really think is the main point of this. And what I want you to note is that Rebecca is taking things into her own hands here. Just like I said before, maybe wait for an open door. I can't help but wonder what would have happened had Rebecca just let things be. God promised, as we looked Sunday, the promise was the older will serve the younger when it came to Jacob and Esau. The promise was Jacob is going to be the one that will be blessed. If Rebecca had just believed the promise and not took things into her own hands, what maybe would have happened? Might have, might have happened a little more peacefully. Yeah, maybe, maybe God would have come and just spoke to Isaac and said, stop. Maybe he would have all of a sudden been mute. I don't know, but I'll bet this, Rebecca wouldn't have lost her son for the next 20 years. There were consequences to taking things into their own hands. It's not the first time this has happened in Scripture. Remember Moses? God says, you're going to be the deliverer of my people. He thinks, okay. He's out one day and he sees an Egyptian beating his uh, brother is Israelites, right? He comes in and he kills that Egyptian, buries him in the sand. As a result, that is known. It comes to be known and he has to run away for 40 years. Okay. Now, God still blesses him. God still takes care of him. But there are consequences to disobedience. No matter how justified it might seem, there are always consequences to disobedience. Always. Uzzah. Bringing the ark into the temple, into Jerusalem. Remember that? The oxen stumble, the ark... And he reaches out his hand to stable it. He's killed. And you're thinking, God, lighten up. Right? Consequences. It doesn't matter. Yeah, we can justify, well, God, we just were trying to help you. Okay? Always consequences. There is only one way to avoid these consequences. Walk in obedience to God, period. Not to be saved, but I'll tell you what, it avoids earthly consequences. When we step outside of God's umbrella of his law, we open ourselves up to have rain on, to, be, to get wet. It's that simple. One of the stories, I didn't get to this Sunday, but do you remember the story of the prophet? Um, I think it's in Kings. I, I don't remember exactly now. But where you have this man of God. And God tells him to go to Israel, to Bethel, and he says, you warn them. And he goes in and he warns them that this altar that they have been sacrificing things to, he says, God is going to split it in two. Josiah is coming. He's going to burn the bones of uh, people on this altar. And the king reaches out his hand. And he says, seize him. And his hand begins to wither. And he's like, ah! And so the prophet prays for him and he's fine. And, and he says, you know, what can I give you? And he says, God told me that when I come into Bethel, he says, you don't eat or drink anything here and you don't go home the same way that you came. Well, there were some people that saw all this happen. They go home and tell their father about it. And the father is called an old prophet as well. The Bible calls him a prophet. And we see then that, that prophet tells his sons, which way did he go? Saddle my donkey. So the prophet of God is on his way home, a different route. But this old prophet then gets on a donkey and goes, catches him and says, hey, come to my house and eat. And he says, well, I can't. God told me, don't eat, don't drink, and don't go home the same way you came. And he says, well, I too am a prophet. And God told me I'm supposed to bring you home to eat. And the guy says, okay, well, if God told you, I'll do it. He goes home, he eats. And then all of a sudden, the word of God tells me, it says, you're going to die. You're not going to be buried in the tomb of your fathers. Right? And sure enough, he's on his way home. A lion comes, kills him. The old prophet hears about this, goes over and sees him. The lion is sitting there right with the donkey. The donkey is untouched, but the prophet is dead. Again, you're like, God, lighten up. A prophet 
told him. How many times has that happened to us today? Where we think, well, you know, godly people tell us. I'll tell you something, if it goes against God's word, I don't care if it's your favorite pastor. You don't listen to him. Why did God do this? Well, the same reason I think that he takes him into the promised land and all of that. I mean, I could give you hundreds of examples. He says, the Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. Why did God give you the commandments? Was it to be a killjoy? No, it was for your protection and to test you, to see if you love the God with all your heart and soul and mind. I think that it was really, that old guy really was a prophet. He probably really did hear a message from God because God was going to test this other prophet to see. And when you don't listen to the word of God, there are consequences. And I could give you story upon story in the Old Testament where this happens, where it's if God says it, guys, you cannot justify it in any way to reason it out, to make it fit your hopes, desires, emotional truths, whatever it is. We see that with homosexuality all the time. There are pastors out there saying, it's okay to practice homosexuality. No, it's not. That goes against the word of God. Period. And so we must listen to the voice of of God. You see, guys, the Ten Commandments, the whole Exodus is a picture and a pattern of our life. We see that God calls them. Then we see He comes and redeems them. The whole Passover story, right? Redemption. They are now redeemed. Then they go through the Red Sea, which 1 Corinthians 10 says is a type of baptism. Then what happens? They just get to go to the heaven, right? Isn't that, isn't that what we do? Isn't that our pattern today? Hey, I'm called. I'm now saved. Next, I go to heaven. Or baptized, then go to heaven. No. What's the next step? Sinai. He gives them the Ten Commandments. Before they were saved or after they were saved? After. Why? Because he was going to test them. He says, now here are the Ten Commandments. Because you are saved, you obey me. Isn't that kind of what it says in the New Testament? If you love me, you will do what I say. Right? Yeah, you see, obedience doesn't come before you're saved or to get saved. You're saved, then God says, thou shalt and thou shalt not. And now you go through your 40-year desert wandering of your life. And God is saying, are you going to keep my commandments? Do you love me? Or do you not? Maybe you love the world more than you love me. Then they cross into the promised land after the seventh trumpet at Jericho. Right? It's that whole pattern. But today we have our idea in the church that there was the Ten Commandments in the past. Now we're saved and now we're free and the law is no longer effective. No, no, no. Romans says the law is good as long as one uses it properly. Right? And so the commandments of God are still important for us today. Even though the condemnation of those, the, the law has been taken away. I am free. Okay? There is no condemnation because I can't keep the commandments any better than they could. But I am free. Okay? Anyway, a long... I'd, I could go on and on on that. So, he says, look here in verse 6. Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, verse 7, bring me some game and prepare the same tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully to do what I tell you. Go out of your, to your flock, give me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father the way he likes it. Then take your father... Or take it to your father to eat, so that he may give you your blessing before he dies. We read that, but verse 11. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. I love that. It would appear. No, you are. <laughs> Isn't that how we like to kind of justify our sins too? Yeah, you see, he was worried more how it would look than what it really was. 
How many things in our life do we do because we're more concerned about what it looks like to others rather than what it really is? True character is what you are like in your own bedroom, in your own home, by yourself. Okay? If you're at home and you're living in a different life than you are here at church, then there's something wrong with that character that needs adjusted. God can fix it. Okay, but I'm just saying that we, when we examine ourselves, ask yourself, who am I? Do, do people know the true me? Okay, or am I covering up and appearing to be somebody I'm not? Verse 13, his mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and let them get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of, his, of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his, his neck with the goat skins. She handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father, yes, my son, he answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? Well, the Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him, and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? He asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate. And he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. Now this is just amazing to me. He knows this is wrong. God told him who was supposed to do this, and now he's saying, May it be the opposite of what God has said. And so, very important here. It goes on. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. I'd love to, if I had more time, to talk about the importance of blessings. We don't really understand that today, but it's, it's, they're more than just words. Everything that he's saying here is going to come true. Okay, And even this... The same thing with Abraham. Those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. That promise is now passed on. And it has been passed on to even today. I firmly believe that if you bless Israel, you're blessed. If you curse them, you're cursed. Now, by the way, this isn't, hey, just give Israel money. How do you really bless Israel? You give them the gospel. So I am against these Zionists who are out there just to get Israel, you know, Jews back to their homeland so that they're back in their homeland and think they're blessing Israel, but they won't give them the gospel. Okay? That's not blessing them. And again, we could talk a lot about this, but the point is, it's still in effect today. You want to destroy your country? Reject Israel. Study history. There is not a country in the world throughout history who has gone against Israel that survives. Okay? Might look like they're winning for a short time, but God will always step in throughout all of history. There is not a nation that has been so blessed and so taken care of that, that shouldn't have been wiped off of the face of the earth by now. You look at the pogroms, you look at the Holocaust, I mean, all through history, this little tiny nation. Even the wars, when you look at the Yom Kippur War of 1973, the 1967 war, all of these things, no reason Israel should be in the world in existence. But this promise is still there. Bottom line. Um, Verse 30, after Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, my father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, who are you? I'm your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. 
Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed, he will be blessed. Here it says he trembled violently. The Hebrew word there is like literally petrified. Why? I think his sin was exposed and he knew God knew. I just went against God's word and he was petrified because he went against God and he knew it at this point, I believe. What I love about this story is this, guys. Everything in Isaac was screaming, something's not right. But he could feel the goat hair. He could smell the outdoors on his clothing. But he says the voice is that of Jacob. But all the senses, his smell, his emotions, who wanted to give Esau a blessing, his touch, were deceptive. The Bible says in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful and wicked beyond cure. Who can understand it? He was operating off of his heart. There was one thing that was screaming truth. What was it? The voice. I talked about this on Sunday. It was, as John Corson says, the word that he heard. The word that was heard you guys want to keep from going off track and being swayed and deceived by your heart, your own emotions, deceived by the world and what they're telling you, all the lies and deceptions that are there. There's one thing that will keep you from falling for the lie, the word that you hear, the word of God. To me, I think that's the most important point of this entire story. It is the word that's going to give you truth. You want to know about global warming? It'll be in there. You want to know about creation? It's going to be in there. You want to know about abortion? Is it right or wrong? It's in there. Okay? There isn't a single thing in there that isn't that something that the word is going to guide you. And you say, well, abortion's not talked about. Well, not the word abortion, but murdering babies. You know, and even in the law, it said that if you were, there was a pregnant woman and you hit her and the baby died, what was the penalty? Death. Yeah, it's all in there. The only way to not be deceived is to follow what the word says. If Jacob would have listened to the word, the voice, I'm sorry, Isaac would have listened to the voice, he wouldn't have been uh, deceived. If that prophet of God would have not, you know, listened to the old prophet and his emotions, I bet he was hungry and thirsty, but would have just listened to the word that he heard that definitely came from God. He wouldn't have been deceived. Sunday, I talked about the other story with Jeremiah and when these other prophets of God are telling them, hey, Babylon, you're going to be freed from Babylon and within two years, you're going to break the yoke off their neck. Jeremiah says, listen, this is what the word of God said. You're a false prophet. But the people wanted their loved ones back. They wanted to believe the message that we're going to be free in two years. Just like there's so many people in America today who think America's the greatest nation in the country, nobody can conquer America. Or that, you know what, if we don't turn someday, God's going to remove his hand of blessing. Guys, it's so much more than that. He's not going to just remove his hand of blessing. He's going to bring the wrath of God on America. That's what the word tells me. He's not just going to step back. He's going to bring it. That's the word. You can count on it. Don't let your emotions, your hopes, and your desires deceive you. Let the Word tell you what's going to happen. Well, we're about out of time here. So when Esau, verse 34, heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father, with a loud cry. Hebrew says, though he even sought it with tears. But it warns us, do not be godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his birthright prior to this. Because Esau really didn't care about the godly blessings. What did he want? The physical blessings. He wasn't concerned about the spiritual. He just wanted the, the money, the cattle, the flocks, and people to serve me. That's what Esau wanted. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people in church in this whole prosperity gospel that I do not believe in. Same thing. 
You know, you come to Jesus, obey Him, and God's going to give you a million dollars. You know, give to this ministry, and you're going to God will give you ten times as much. Uh uh. He'll bless you, absolutely. But maybe not the way you're thinking. There's a reason that the prayer says, Give us this day our daily bread, not give us today our lottery to set me up for life. Our daily bread causes God to rely on Him on a day to day basis. That's where He wants us. Relying on Him. Um, Esau said, well, for verse 35, but he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, now he's taking my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you and have made all his relatives his servants. I have sustained him with grain and new wine, so what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. 77-year-old man bawling because he can't get some kind of physical thing. That's what's going on here. Okay. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. And generally this is true, that he will serve Jacob for the next 900 years, but there is a time, the time of Ahaz, when he's going to break that yoke and, and kind of Israel will serve them for a short time. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke off your neck. That's what happens. Um, you know, when I used to read this when I was younger, I used to think, well, why not? Just, I mean, why can't you bless them both? Why? Because the promise. We're following a line of Christ. We're following a line that through the Messiah is going to come. And there can only be one. That promise only goes to one. It, and I talked about this on Sunday, about being children of Abraham. It's not a DNA thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a thing of the promise. It went through Abraham. Not, uh, then it goes through Isaac, not Ishmael. Even though they both had that DNA. Now it's going to go through Jacob, not Esau. And then it's going to go through Jacob's sons. Okay, but the tribe of Judah is the one that Christ will come from. But anyway, uh, just that's why. It's because of the promise. Um, it goes on in verse 41. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for that my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my, bro or to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets, which is going to be 20 years, what you did to him, when he forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from the Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. So, again, there are consequences to taking things into our own hands. And um, we went through things fast here. I know there's so much more that we could look at but again, it is all God's promises that are being followed through here. It is by His grace, not because of their goodness, their integrity, but because of God's mercy. And that's the same thing that we see for us in our life today. It is not because of what we have done, but because of His mercy. And that same promise that we're following here is the promise that we cling to today that gives us that righteousness. So uh, that promise is the key through this whole thing. All right. Well, we better close in prayer. Um, then I, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys want to. So, Lord, thank you for the time that you've given us again. And thank you for that promise. Father, let us not trample on that promise, the blood, the oath, 
Let us um, just rest in you. Guide us in all truth. Let us have ears to hear that word of yours, that we would study it, that we would memorize it, that we would meditate upon it, that we would know so that when the world says something that goes against it, it would scream lie, that we would know that that truth is what sets us free. It is the truth that shows us the way. It is that truth that gives us life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Any thoughts or questions that anybody else had? I just wanted to speak to the, the true tragedy of the story. Like the dude gets goat hair from a goat. <laughs> yeah. And he puts it on, and his dad's like, oh, yeah, that's his son. And then yeah. he smells it. The dude with the goat hair, and he's like, yeah, that's his son. Like, Gross, man. Yeah, I think that that's where cologne was invented, was after this. By the way, before I forget, too, if any of you would like to um, uh, help with the Semi-Source Museum at the State Fair, I know Sean will talk about it maybe later. I forgot to mention it Sunday, but... Uh, I'm leaving a sign-up sheet for him here, and we need, like, I need 99 people or 99 slots filled for the State Fair, so it's a big endeavor, but our museum will be at the State Fair, and it's free for people to go through it, and we just need volunteers to hand out headphones and collect them, and you'll be inside an air-conditioned uh, trailer to do so, um, so you'll be out of the elements, so it's not going to be real cool, but it, it definitely is, isn't bad inside, so... Um, if that's something you want to do, make sure you find the sign up sheet, whatever he'll do with it. And so, yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, thank you guys for allowing me to come and share here with you again. Um, appreciate that, appreciate what you're doing here at the church here at New Life. So, yeah, you bet. Do you want that turned off or...